You're welcome back. And it's the key points on TV3 and 3FM. So on Wednesday, the much anticipated uh, Fix the Country demonstration happened. And it was really clear. It was a non-partisan anti-NDC, anti-MPP, anti-establishment demonstration where many, uh, you know, sought to project what their views were. So evidently it was a success. And most importantly, it was peaceful. Attendees represented a cross-section of society, young and old, tradespeople, educated people, you know, ministers of the gospel and professionals, the every man and every woman of our society. And it's been a forceful representation of the frustrations that many Ghanaians are facing today. And among their prime demands, uh, a new constitution for a new generation, demanding the expunging of Article 71 from the Constitution, the creation of a movement that resists political intrusion, you know, that creates a citizen-led change uh, for governance, and also to address our systemic failures, the problems of unemployment, bad roads, insecurity, all of these, uh, quite a tall order, the movement wants addressed by the current NPP government. And I'll be introducing our panel shortly, but let's bring you uh, some sights, sounds, and a report from that Fix the Country demonstration on Wednesday. 72. Solomon Kwaukume has longed for a day like this to make his advocacy for the oil sector, he says, has been fraught with several challenges. It's an opportunity I've been waiting for for the past 12 years. And the opportunity has arrived for me to come out, to join the youth, to tell the youth that the day is a historic day for them to liberate themselves from the shackles of economic exploitation. Aided by his walking stick, he marched all the way through to the Black Star Square in solidarity with the movement. <laughs> His fellow septuagenarian is Akusia Yeboa, who is barely holding up. They were young people, persons with disability, those who had traveled from the Ashanti, Easting, and Volta regions. Since he was able to tell the late president to fix Ghana, to fix the economy, we are telling him to fix Ghana for us. We are tired. The youth of Ghana, we are suffering. Look at me. Look, at me. I'm a construction man. That is why I brought this one. Look, how much is cement? Today, it's 50 cities. 50 cities. Look, when are, when are we going to build? I'm a teacher at Abuasi. You have changed the curriculum for about two years, but you have uh, given a textbook syllabus. Several times I lost my colleagues as the crowd thickened, but the people were determined to make this one count. Never mind the sweat and distance, the protesters spoke. Nobody was to be left out. We are against the bad leadership of this nation, the bad governance of this nation. Now at this, our church members, when they come to church, they can't give offering. They can't pay their tithe because all our members are broke. There are no jobs in this our nation. Ten after ten, the conveners addressed the crowd. Today, we are assembled here to protest against the system. But arguably the most emotional was this one from the eldest daughter of a slain activist in Nigeria, Mohamed Kaka. If my uncle is the true justice, you have a reason to believe Ghana can... Ghana can... Ghana can and we will work. For convenience of a protest, Wednesday's action is only the beginning of an awakening. We are calling for the abolition of the Sakawa 1992 constitution. And we are gathering one million names and signatures of Ghanaians who are with us on that path. By the time we are done, the 1992 constitution can no longer hold the legitimacy over us. The group hopes to sustain the momentum and drive until the system 
is fixed. And that report was filed by Komla Adum and Mawina Egbeta um, about the Fix the Country demonstration on Wednesday. Well, our panel today, Oliver Baka Vomawa, he is the convener for the Fix the Country movement. He's also a private legal practitioner and academic. We have Mami Awinado. She's a consultant with Blackbridge Consulting as well, focusing a lot on trade. Also, Dr. Soji Soji Tete who is a council chair for the Center for Social Justice. A young panel talking about wishes for a new generation. Thank you all very much for making time to come in on a Saturday morning and for joining me for the first time on The Key Points. Thank you for having us. All right. So um, just quick preliminary comments I'd like to take from each of you about two key issues that have been uh, raging yesterday as at the time we completed our production. So the University of Ghana... Uh, KNUST have uh, adjusted the academic calendars. Exams are suspended for the moment because of a strike action, as well as the uh, parliamentary debate about the report on the Sputnik V probe, where we procured uh, some 300,000 uh, Sputnik V vaccines, paid an advance payment. However, that was all not evident in the probe. So, Dr. Soji Teta, I'd like to start with you, your, your immediate comments on first... Um, the University of uh, Ghana and KNUSD strike? Well, I think it's very unfortunate that we keep having these cycles of industrial unrest. Of course, you know my background from the Medical Association and the fact that most often than not is the government reneging on some of its promises. So at this point, I think that the Labour Commission needs to go beyond just making a declaration about the legality or the illegality of the action and call both parties and really ensure that where agreements have been flouted, and not you know, implemented, they get the government to get back on track. Because at the end of the day, it's the students that end up suffering. Yeah. And what about the Sputnik V probe? You are with the um, Center for Social Justice, and a bit of the work you do is also focused on health and addressing issues relating to health. I mean, we've been very concerned about the whole matter pertaining to the vaccines. You know, when you talk about the prices at which we were purchasing them, it was clear that it was way above even the market rate. So we're quite happy that the matter was being logged into. And the impression one got from the initial um, representation by the health minister was that we have not made any financial commitments. And now we seem to be getting different information. I think that we need a full-scale probe into the matter. Let's establish the facts. And I would hope that once the facts are established, the necessary actions will be done aimed at sanitizing the leadership system and then also recouping whatever funds have been paid out especially as we are not getting the vaccines yeah thanks very much so um mommy now another strike <laughs> and also another probe that has emerged that we've advanced monies that let's face it resources are hard for us as a country y your thoughts on those yeah i mean um uh, what can I say? I mean, my, my number one concern is actually the students. I mean, of course, like, the labor force and what, like, they, their needs and their requirements are very important. I'm just thinking of the fact that it's unfortunate that in a time such as this, you have, um, you know, these young people who have, like, you know, have dreams and goals and aspirations, right, at the, at the, they become victims, right, to a very weak and broken system. So I'm really hoping that something tangible and long-lasting, sustainable solution can be found to the problem. But it's just sad, like, at a time such as this, when they have exams, to, they're already talking about the fact that COVID already affected their, like, their curriculum, right? Already COVID, you know, everyone took I'm it concerned in the education because already sector. Even, yeah, pre-COVID, they finish school and they don't even have jobs, right? Yeah. And, and, so, and then their skills are already questionable. And so how much more when there's something like this? So I'm even looking at the long-term repercussions of this. Mm. So I'm really hoping that sooner than later this can be addressed. But Any yeah. thoughts on Sputnik V? Yeah, I was, I was wondering. I mean, I think when it comes to even procurement or something like this, there should have been more involvement of public administrators. Like, I'm just wondering how even the procedure and also even beyond the money like um look at the fda element like whether you know like just like the recklessness with it we are looking at human lives i mean look at how other countries have taken this thing so serious in the wto you have ingozi busy act like you know advocating right with um developed states that african countries can have these vaccines 
you know, like um, without having to pay so much for patents. And it's like, here we are playing games with having it's a shake. I'm just very confused when it comes to human yeah, life. Three, like, there were three <laughs> entities involved. But it's yeah, very confusing. I'm quite just like, confusing. Yeah, yeah, we really playing games with people's lives. Like it's quite, it's concerning. So I'm really hoping. Certainly part of the things that we need to fix as a country. So Oliver, I guess this sits squarely within <laughs> the scope of some of the things you would like to see changed, believe? I, I feel like in some respects I've become the apostle of what needs to be fixed in this country. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, I think the bigger question regarding, first of all, let me start with the university issue, is that we, we've quickly become a republic that thrives on crisis. And that instead of anticipating the problem, instead of dealing with them, we have to force, force people into a box. We have to make them feel that like they have no other option to, to cause a massive disruption to the academic calendar. And why do we thrive on those? Why do we elevate those moments of crisis as the only time when we are inclined to sit at the table and have a conversation. And this is reflected in so many aspects of our lives and perhaps reflects the conversations we are having around fixing the country as well. <laughs> the vaccine. So yes, I, I, a lot of the sentiments which have been expressed resonate with me. I was one of the people marching in Cambridge against AstraZeneca asking for developing countries to get vaccines. And to see the extent to which we despite the efforts being put by so many people and so many stakeholders in liberalizing vaccine procurements and all those issues, we continue to make a mess of the pandemic in total. And I do think that the, the call for a broader look into the issue should surpass vaccine. It should go to the entirety of the pandemic response. And I say this because I'm reminded when the Minister of Health came before Parliament for vetting, he said that when the pandemic first hit, he had convened an interministerial committee to set up responses, and that they convened three meetings and none of the other ministers showed up. And I wondered to myself, in a global pandemic, when Ghanaian lives are threatened, our members of parliament, um, our ministers cannot even act together to be able to find us responses. Then there's something wrong with the way in which we, we approach governance in total. And I think those are the questions we need to look at again and again. Going forward, yeah. Thanks very much uh, for those preliminary uh, comments. Now let's dig deep into the demonstration and what the aftermath looking into the future could be. Um, I'll start, I'll stay with you, Oliver, briefly on that. So you issued a statement or the movement issued a statement after the demonstration indicating that it was, you know, a success. Uh, it, it reflected the views. You thanked people for coming out in, in a nonpartisan way to, you know, affirm all these issues that had been raised. I guess the the important thing I saw was in point five, that the demonstration coming off eventually reflects a, a determination of the people in spite of the use of legal and state means to stifle uh, this process. You met the IGP afterwards, I understand. Are you surprised there's been no reaction, no major comment from government, from Jubilee House, from the Ministry of Information? No, I'm not surprised. because. I do think that, and perhaps it ties in into this conversation around waiting for crisis, because these conversations around fixing the country and the issues we've been raising have been in the public domain for almost four months now. So I'm not particularly expecting that the demonstration must provoke a reaction from them. A lot of people do. But I do think the way in which the issue should be reacted to should even start and predate the demonstration. So we did not see that. And I'm not expecting that they're going to change rhetoric around this. The president has barely spoken about this issue. So it's not going to surprise me. We are continuing to do what we want to do. Because we've always said from the very beginning that the conversation we want to have is with the people of Ghana themselves. They own the democracy. And the process must engage them. So there's really no rush on our end. And we don't see it in any particular way as a failure of government that has spoken to us. Because they are not our audience for this process. Mm -hmm. Mami, are you um, surprised at the turnout? I mean... Many of us were waiting with bated breath as to whether really would people come out. Mm -hmm. uh, do really people really affirm what the movement has been saying? Because this started as an online activity. Yeah. Lots of young people heavily engaged online. I, I don't know about Baka, but maybe Soji and I, we were B we are BBC born before computers. <laughs> so I, I get the sense was would other people other than young people engaged um, on a tech level mm -hmm. come out yeah I know I mean I wasn't surprised I think that even probably maybe more people would have if people were not feeling the brunt of what the economy is right now I know people who are like saddled so much with 
debt with problems that even the idea of even going on the road you know i don't know if you understand like the idea of like because i was even talking to somebody the day before and it's like hey i have to pay my work it's like the stress of it alone to even get up and even go on the street so even to see people who went there first of all kudos to them that they've had the, the agency to express what they are feeling with the country i for one for example i have just been i think i've been t talking on social media for like a few years now and you get to a point where you're asking yourself that is it getting anywhere and i don't feel that way because they've been sharing and you go on platforms and we talk because Ghana we talk a lot so you're asking yourself then what is the next step or the next strategy right beyond the speaking so first of all i could also people we really now being able to like get up I, you know the best part of the protest for me when i was even watching when i had time was when they were educating the people about the history because people need to be informed knowledge is power but the thing is that we need to also be careful because now that people are getting informed and they know they're going to ask for better. And are we positioned to give them that? If not, because you have placed people in a position where they don't have so much to lose, right? Because right now people don't have jobs. Life is hard. And then now they're getting informed about the fact that it can be better. And I can't have a right to ask for more. And then you're not giving them that. If we don't respond and our government doesn't respond effectively to like even start engaging people, we are sitting on a ticking time more because now, you know the Arab Spring, it's like you cannot, this generation, I think that you're exposed to so much. Like they see everything, you're seeing what life can be for you. And we've seen it with the Olympics, those who have left, seen a lot of Africans or, you know, people of African descent running for developed regions, you know, and, and for Arab states. And you're seeing that people now are looking at like, hey, I can have a better life, right? Why not? But yet, you are not giving them something to live for. Yeah. If you don't, you're placing ourselves in a very Dr. Swati Teta, certainly um, these issues being raised are not new. Mm. Um, I know that we've had issues even from the 60s, then in the 70s. I mean, uh, people left the country because of issues like this, the economic issues in the 70s, in the 80s, similar. And now we are in the years, the millennial years. What for you is the reason why we still have to be talking or agitating about these issues? Should we be disappointed maybe in the path we've taken? Maybe democracy hasn't yielded the fruits we thought it would. I mean, clearly, having participated in the demonstration, the disappointment was clear. And in the beginning, there were those that asked whether we could transition from a social media agitation to actually putting boots on the ground. But when you arrived on the site, it was just clear that it was a totally different ball game. I was really struck by how individuals that I did not know would walk up to me. And I don't explain. think anybody who most of the people who came to that event knew that knew who they were like they didn't know each other. Yes, and they would explain with a lot of anger, a lot of frustration about how the system was not working. Mm -hmm. They would point out potholes to me, they would point out dilapidated buildings, and they would talk about the role of government. But I think your question is why now and is it really new? I don't think it's, it's new. But Ghanaians have become used to, I think, a certain eight-year cycle. We've talked about the past. The 1992 constitution was supposed to bring an end to all of these incidents of field governance. It was supposed to be a new beginning. It was supposed to deliver a certain promise of democracy, so to speak. Now we have all the trappings of democracy and yet we do not deliver that promise. People go and vote, but they don't have the jobs. You know, we have parliamentary committees on public accounts, and yet we see judgment decks. We see governments entering into contracts without due process. We see governments abrogating all sorts of contracts, and 80% of judgment decks resulting from these contract breaches, and yet there is absolutely no accountability. We live in a system where there's provision for an auditor general every year to audit public accounts. So actually, you do have the evidence of public sector corruption, and there is no remedial action. There is no action on it. So what the people observe is that we have these eight-year cycles with the promise of so much and the delivery of so little. So there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of expectation, and by the end of eight years, there's so much frustration. And they are feeling that they're, taken for, they're getting taken for granted. The public sectors workers are given a 4% salary increment, and politicians yeah. get very juicy packages. What is the reason for that? So the point that 
Nanajwa, Mami, yes. is raising is pertinent. For how long are we going to go with this promising the people, hyping up their hopes and expectations, and then dashing it? If we do not pay attention to it and address it now, there might well be an eruption. And I know that in the aftermath of this Fix the, March, Fix the Country, Country campaign, the president has talked about winning 2024. <laughs> it's so, like it's like for you, this is not is like is this not a priority? Yes. Your priority is the next election. So the priority is the next election, and for most people, that's what it is. And something has to give. And I'm hoping that with this series of actions that have been planned by by the team, hopefully, you know, it will make people pause to reflect. I would just say that I have to give the convener some credit mm -hmm. because I don't think that people just showed up like that. This is a mass mobilization effort. So I'm sure that they really went out of their way to talk to people. So I just want to give them credit for that as well. Mami, um, what are the low hanging fruits, for instance, that can be quickly dealt with that gives a sense of one government actually demonstrating that they are listening mm -hmm. to the issues raised by uh, the, the, the movement? So realistically speaking, and I think I mentioned this before, because the problems are so systemic and um, you're looking at decades of issues, one of the key things would be to start appointing people who have skill, who can do the work. When I say appointing, it's... So it means. must be a meritocracy. It yes. mustn't be a political patronage. No. So right now, what I'm saying that in but, this... But then that, I don't know if that's realistic. So political me... parties... <laughs> Political parties are entities, they come into office. Yes. Obviously, they won't appoint people outside their party. There are rare instances right. of professionals yes. who have made their mark and are brought in to support. But that's really... Because honestly, Babajiva, let me ask you, because the thing is this, if, because being a politician doesn't mean you have skill. And if you don't have people who have skill or gifted people to do the work, then it's a hopeless situation. That's what I, why I'm saying that, like, so for example, let's say Kagame, who brought in um, this Tiami guy from Senegal, who was with um, mm. Mm. Um, oh, IF. Oh, uh, uh, Tijon Thiam. Yes, and then, you know, he's not even Rwandese, but yes, he brought him uh, in. Yes, he's Ivorian. Yes. yes, and then seeing their real, like, the situation in the country and realizing that, you no, know, Kagame is always open to bringing people. Now, I'm not trying to make a comparison, but what I'm trying to say is that when you are dealing with a problem in your house, okay, imagine your fridge is broken. Now you're thinking, okay, I can't buy a new fridge, okay? And um, I need to get it fixed. What are you going to do? You're thinking of who can fix the fridge, yeah. right? If I was, in, in, I was uh, in the MPP or I was the president or whatever it is, I'll be thinking right now, like, look, the situation is bad. The people I have there right now, people are, because there are people who don't really know what they are doing. I'm just, and this is no offense to anybody in power. There are people now who are holding office who don't know the work. If I were them, I would even ask, find somebody in the meantime, because we have three years left with you unless something drastic happens. Find somebody. It's okay to not know. And that is it. We have this, um, we lack intellectual humility in this country. Honestly speaking, it's okay not to know and it's okay to say, you know what, we need help. And it's okay to be able to outsource that help and find people who can do the work. And at the end of the day, we have three years left. What is a drastic thing you can do right now? Let's say, for example, it was the energy sector. Find people with skill. This thing of finding friends and stuff, truth of the matter is we all want the same thing. And we can't, and it's like, if I, if I had three years left in power, and I have a legacy to leave, and we are so desperate to come back into power, then you know what was the most drastic thing you do in three years? You're going to find people who can give you results in three years. What kind of results? The most tangible results, right? Maybe you're, you cannot necessarily build a bunch of hospitals all of a sudden. But what are the little things that you can do that will at least alleviate the so pressure? So that at least people, if it's, and if it's fixing NHIS so people can have good health care, that's a low-hanging fruit. Absolutely. If it's about um, jobs, ensure yes. that there are some sustainable yes. jobs, not NAPCO, yes. 700, 800 yes. CDs. Um, I mean, I, I guess th those are the areas you, for you that Absolutely. are important. Yes, exactly. So you're going to create jobs and you're going to find that maybe at the end of the day, it's like, okay, fine. Who you, I, if I could, I'll find somebody. I'll be like, hey, listen, within the next three months, I want you to help me come up with something to be able to solve this problem, ABC, right? And then come up with a plan. I'll, maybe I'm not even announce it to anybody. Yeah. Because I outsource the help. Because sometimes you cannot outsource, you can outsource skill. 
Yeah. Get that person to give you the results you want. And then you begin to see, people will even begin to see change on the level, to some extent. To some extent. Yeah, that's what I, I would, I, I that, don't know, maybe I'm just you, off. You but like <laughs> yeah, and, and <laughs> I must admit, it's interesting you mentioned Thijon Thiam. He yeah. was the um, CEO for Credit Suisse right. and had also been head of Prudential in the UK. Right. And, and that's the kind of person that, yeah, you would want to, to help you fix something. Yeah. Uh, Oliver, so two things I want to raise with you. Um, mm. So the issue of social justice. Mm. I guess that was quite a fundamental pillar for this march. And uh, Kaka, who died in uh, Idra, um, which sparked the disturbances, his daughter spoke. To what extent are you confident that the element or the issue to address social justice is one that we can do? So let me make a quick point. I mean, I'm Oliver after all, and I'm asking for more. Uh, there's, something, <laughs> there's something that the two of them said, and I must give a lot of credit to so many of the people we have been trying to, and organizing this with. Because even among ourselves, so many of them I met for the first time on the day, or persons who I've been speaking to consistently for the past three months. A lot of them I did not even know their names. And when I say their names, their real names, because one of the decisions we had taken was to protect people's identity. So it was really refreshing to meet so many people. But we also left no stone unturned. I've never met these two individuals ever in person, but I reached out to both of them to come for the event. So we, we made sure that we were reaching out to so many individuals and we took nobody for granted. And it was important for us to get that work done. And it's really impressive to me that so many of the core team who were doing this were persons who were younger than 25. And it's really refreshing for me to think of persons who are so committed to advancing the process. Now, to your question, one of the things we started from the very beginning was that the way towards reforming our system was to be able to create a sense of the beauty of dissent and that to make people feel confident in their voices and the ability to, to say no, to disagree. And, and this is why the Kaka issue has become very important to us. Because if we leave it to fester, it rolls back what we are trying to do. This idea that any time you speak up, any time you do something, Person, something can happen to you and nobody cares. Like what happened to Amitwali, that there's never any answers when it matters. And this is why we've taken up that cause, that for us to be able to reform the system, citizens ought to feel confident enough to be able to engage that system without fear that any time you, you do anything than praising for the regime, you're going to lose your life. Our democracy should be able to make space for dissent. And we saw that we saw the, the disappointing reality of when we tried to put up a billboard and within less than two days it was pulled down. And he said, if our democracy cannot even sustain or make room for a billboard, it is not fit for purpose. These are some of the questions we want to be able to have. But now, is it fair to blame uh, our democracy? There are always rogue elements. Um, within groups and entities that may be over enthusiastic, they may be uh, exuberant, and no one has told them to pull down your billboard or pull down a billboard in opposition to a current administration. But they do it anyway because they are seeking to self protect and, and maintain a certain self interest in favor of someone. So, because there's a culture that creates a system whereby persons anticipate the needs of leadership. And by doing so, act undemocratically because they know that to act properly and constitutionally will end them repercussions from persons above. It's, it saves down. So that's what you see. For instance, in the particular case of the billboard, the person who owned it had received so many calls from persons affiliated to government to pull it down or she was going to lose her job with the AMA. This is the, these are the issues you're talking about. And the face of oppression has changed in the country, whether they target the nerve points of economic oppression. So many people, people who had been uh, mobilizing with us, have had their jobs threatened. They have had persons who were working from in offices of, in the office of the president, ministers' offices, who had called their employers directly. Persons who have received query letters just because they tweeted, face the country. So these are issues that has become the way in which the, this democracy shields oppression. And that's the kind of things we're talking about and trying to advance. Now, even let's talk about the police, for instance. Almost every time, the police take an unconstitutional action. The response is always order from above. And a lot of times, there may not in fact be an order from above, but it's an, an anticipation of the needs of the above. So if the above is a core group of persons who are not democratically inclined, persons below them get the message. 
It's the same thing that happened with Dumelevo, for instance. When he came out and said, beyond himself, all the individuals who had worked with him had either been demoted, sacked, or transferred. It sends down the message that anybody that dares try to do different and not play by the rules would have these repercussions. And I've seen this in the public service. I worked with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I've seen so many public servants, rather than do what is right, would choose to disengage because it is more protective of themselves. Why would they stick their neck out if, if the replications are so dire and nobody is going to stick up for them? This is what we are talking about, about the need to reform the culture of the country because, before we can deliver on those promises we are talking about. Um, Dr. Soji Tete, one of the things one would refer to is how difficult it is to actually achieve results. Mami Awenado mentioned a certain strategy and in a sense if you have three years to go you have nothing to lose if you want to effect change but you need people to be on board as well so i'm just wondering getting that balance is that achievable it's achievable i mean what i find interesting in this current conversation is the fact that we are talking about a government in the first year only the first year of a, four of year a second term, term. And this is not a new administration, you know. So I would even have expected that in terms of continuity, we would have seen greater fluency. But up until this point, we do not have CEOs of agencies appointed. Well, they've been appointing them oh, well, in the last few days. Fact, this is August. <laughs> the same <laughs> government has been in power since 2000 and what? 16? Yes, but it is 6,000. So Let's talk it, about, I mean, it's about appointing so 6,000 people. It's about... Uh, look, I mean, let's face it. There'd been a see, huge, they, hold on, there's been a hue and cry about government expenditures, the kind of wastefulness, and even in terms of the numbers of ministers, there was a certain attempt to cut it down. And in terms of even who got what, who got to, who got into parliament, who achieved what, certainly for a second term, if the president is trying to be strategic and he's taking his time to do that, maybe that's not a bad thing. No, I've always been very disappointed with the slow pace of appointments in our, in our public sector, and especially with our governments. And even more disappointed when we see transitions from one government to the same government. So you've seen the people, you know your vision. If you are going to appoint fewer people, that is even more cost for you to appoint in a shorter time. And the implications are not trivial. The fact that we do not have governing boards of state institutions, it's not trivial. I recently had an opportunity to engage with people at the Medical and Dental Council. Foreign doctors have written exams. They don't know whether they've passed or not passed because the results have been withheld. The reason the results have been withheld is because there's no board to approve the release of the results. And people are, you know, waiting. So when Mami talks about the need to appoint competent leaders. We have glaring opportunities and we, we do not make use of them. The second thing also is that it, apart from getting competent people, one needs to make fewer promises. Fewer promises. Yes, fewer promises. And focus on execution. What does it take to actually execute on the promises that have been made? We are in a country with all of these healthcare issues and then we have massive infrastructure projects that have not been completed. And yet we see no effort on the part of the government to complete hospitals and other facilities that are lying in bushes, follow elsewhere. I don't know about no effort because I guess maybe the challenge is the challenge of resources. We know that uh, for our revenue, we spend what almost 80% of that service in our debt. We have just some 20% of that for capital uh, infrastructure and, and other things. So Jifa, tell me, which is easier to complete uncompleted hospitals or What's to promise to build 88 new hospitals. 101. Uh, uh, well, 111, I beg your pardon. There you go. There you go. So it's a question of prioritizing, allocating resources, finding effective personnel, and making sure that there's accountability, holding people responsible within specific timelines. I mean, these are the basic things that we are not seeing. Mm. Mami, I've heard other people say young people may be calling for these things, mm. but young people also have a responsibility. Uh, they also have a responsibility to, uh, you know, acquire the skills, you know, work towards a certain vision and goal for themselves. They should not also see politics as the easy way. So if they are student leaders and then suddenly they see that the way to make it quick, fast and rich is to quickly get into politics. 
it's, it should be no surprise to us mm -hmm. that maybe we have a generation of leaders mm -hmm. who may not have worked in a certain environment, may not have built up certain sets of skills, and they now have to do the kind of things you expect. And if we're not getting results, I don't know if we are to blame, the youth also are to blame. Okay, so pretty much it's like um, the youth taking responsibility? Is that pretty much Yes, I've heard people say that, um, yeah. I mean, like, let me be honest with you. Um, I had this conversation yesterday when we were watching the relay. The relay? Yes. Of uh, 100, the, yes, the, the, the Ghana, the 4 by 100. I so. didn't want us to talk. <laughs> no, actually, we're talking about the team. No, I'm just teasing. Oh, the, 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 about I'm just it. teasing <laughs> because I just wanted to pass like a distant oh. memory. <laughs> so, you know, for me, I like to like, I was, I'm trying to like think deep into the whole thing. So when, I, when the thing was happening, it was over. I, was, I told my mother, I said, look, this just hit me. Even beyond running fast is the skill of passing the baton, yeah. right? Yeah. It's a strategy. Yeah. And also who starts, who finishes, who's in the middle. Mm. You see, generationally, like if you want the next generation to be better, how do you pass the baton? When you pass the baton, the manner in which you do it mm. helps to empower the next person to be able to move quick. And so once, sometimes, even if you look at the, the and I'm sorry I'm using the Olympics, but oh, that's watching, okay. if no. you look at the Go track, ahead. right, even the lane you run in, mm. you see Africa and Ghana, and when I say Africa, because most of African countries, when you go to the, any other, they'll tell you that you're having the same problem. We are running a track whereby every generation is carrying the burden, not only of that generation, but the previous one. Because we are from a history of, um, a history of we come from a history of slavery, colonization, a new colonization. Truthfully, because we don't own much, right? We just have the resources. We don't have money. People are controlling things. Anyway, that's a whole different discussion. And so at the end of the day, for the next generation to do better, the big question is that how are you passing on the baton? Are you holding on the, when you're supposed to run a relay, 4 by 100, are you trying to run a relay like a marathon where an older generation is keeping on to a baton longer than they're supposed to do? So the key thing is that, yes, can the next generation should we take accountability for the fact that there is an entitled generation coming up? Yes, or people are looking for quick results. There's that element too. But the big thing is, where is the mentorship? Where is the guidance? How are you preparing them? I'm only as good as the information I have. The home I'm coming from. What are you teaching your kids? If they come home, what are they, what are they, what are they watching? What kind of values are we passing down? And that is why I feel like our generation, in fact, has so much work. We are carrying the burdens of our parents the thing that they couldn't do, their failures. And then we are now thinking of how to fix theirs, how to fix ours, and make sure that our kids have better. And that is why it's for this generation to ask themselves, that like, what legacy are you leaving? There's so much debt. And then you're asking yourself, what are you passing on? When we don't win the race, you're going to sit there and say they didn't run well. It's not because we didn't run well. When did you pass the baton on to us? How did you train us to run? And so I think this generation really... That's a huge burden. I see so many young people who've come to Ghana are struggling with their business. They're trying to give people opportunities. People are even like, when you get sick, I'm, I'm classified as a, you're supposed to even be part of the middle class. When you get sick, you pray first. <laughs> because you want to tell, like, I have a friend now, she has a medical condition that is even very basic. But her pill, one drug is 140 CDs. How many people can afford, afford that? Afford that, yeah. So I'm asking myself, I really, yes, the generation, we want to take accountability and responsibility, but help us. I think one of the, the, the basic things to judge a country is maternal, you know, health care. Yes. And, and Soji, Dr. Teten knows all too well, right. you know, the kind of experience I've had and the kind of discussions we've had about what health care should be, right. and, and, which is really just the basic thing. So, Oliver, um, looking ahead, next steps for the movement, because at the event, when you gathered at the... Um, is it the Black Star Square? Yes. Um, one, w one of the things that you did was you didn't speak to the media. In fact, you asked the media to go. Why did you do that? I think the media have been quite supportive of the team. So it's almost as if you asked the media to step aside and you only wanted to speak to the people. I mean, I'm just trying to understand mm. what was the um, concept or thinking behind that in order to understand what the next steps are because it's only the media that can convey your next steps. <laughs> so I think it's important to make one thing clear that in deciding that the media should take the backstage and for, for people to come forward, it's not necessarily saying that we do not prioritize and value the media's presence there. But it also reflects something we've been saying consistently, which is that who the audience is. And the audience is the people who had come there and who had been there and that we wanted to engage. 
And she said something about the values that we are passing on the people and what kind of the ways in which we are educating people and raising consciousness. And a lot of times when we say this, people think that we are saying it to be provocative. But we genuinely mean that our audience and our conversation must be with the people. And that if you are trying to get people to understand their role and the value of their voice, you must make them feel that they are involved in a conversation. Not that you've put yourself in a position where you are projecting yourself on TV and making fine speeches to an audience that is not necessarily listening to you. And so that dynamic is what is important to us that we wanted to enforce there. But also going forward beyond that conversation, one of the things that we have done and we, we want to continue to do is that people are only as good as the information they have and what they understand about the process and what this is about. And we cannot achieve that if we come into a space whereby so many young people come and a lot of the times when even when you're speaking to them, they do not understand what you're trying to say to them. So let me give you an example. Uh, one, one of the conveners, Bashira Tokamau, bef so before she went on stage, uh, we had a whole conversation about what language she was going to speak. Mm -hmm. And we decided she was going to speak Hausa. Yeah. And when she finished speaking, a number of people came to her and said this is the first time they've gone to a demonstration that they understood what was being said there. I, I do not express myself well. I, I always say that I'm not interview competent in, in any of the local languages. But I took three that day. And I used that opportunity because I understood that we're having a conversation with a different audience. And that they do not want fine grammar and fine diction to be able to convey the message. You have to break it down in a different way for them to understand. And it was important to be able to do so and tie their concerns into the fundamental structure of this country, which is the Constitution. And that's what we, we did so beautifully that day. And that is the way in which it's going to define the way in which we continue to engage different people and have that conversation with them, because we have to change mindsets. And that was very present as well in a demonstration of this size. When we went there, we got so many dust bin rubbers. What we said, we're thinking about engaging people to sweep after them. The young people took those from us and said, we're having a peaceful and clean demonstration. And we're cleaning up as we're moving from Obrasport right into Independence Square. We have, we have so many images of when political parties have held events where they've let, they've let so much rubbish there at those events. It tells you that there's something different happening. But because we are so engaged in the process of mischief that we are refusing to see the rise in consciousness. But there's also a last point I want to make. Because a lot of times when we talk about this, we're talking about it as if this is only a youth convened event. It goes beyond the young people. It was interesting to see the, the elderly. And I said that, so the, the gentleman which was, was profiled, I met him here actually. I spoke to him at Onya TV and he was in Tema, saw me on TV and came here to meet me wow. before I came out. And we had a conversation and I told him that I think you should go to Independence Square directly. He said no, he insisted that he was going to start and walk as well. And so it was, I, I didn't really think he was going to do it. And to see him do that, it really made me pause. But it also made me pause on what I consider to be the failures of what a demonstration is. Because that's what we are doing now. Instead of critiquing the event, is that we did not make it, it in, in, in accessible enough to, for persons with disability. That we have to provide those frameworks. Because so many of them kick came and did the adios work with them. We have to find ways in which we engage and bring more of those people into so into improve, like this. The inclusivity improve the inclusivity of the of movement the and how how it's accessible Absolutely. to everyone. Absolutely. So these are the things that we are taking and looking at and when we are thinking about what the next one is going to look like and what the things we should prioritize. These are the conversations that we want persons in leadership to have. That after everything there's a post mortem where they're asking themselves, did we deliver to the people and what could we do better? So often we don't feel that. Mm. Quickly before I, I go back to uh, Dr. Tete and uh, Mesa Winado, will there be other demonstrations in other parts of the country? Will it be replicated, let's say, on a regional basis, for instance? Certainly you may not be able to do all 16 regions, but maybe you, you want to do it in sectors or something like that. Our hope is to be able to do it in all 16 regions. That is the plan. Uh, but one of the things we're also very mindful of in, in doing this plan it also has to be very sensitive to public health concerns mm -hmm. as we're moving into the regions. And perhaps the way in which the decision may come would be to prioritize regions where they have low cases and that community transmission is at its lowest. And that might inform the order in which we go without any particular, uh, without particular choosing places based on 
you know, like a con congregation of people and things like that. That's the process we want to do. Because one of the, the reason why we are doing this, uh, I've said consistently, is that we didn't say we wanted to fix, fix Accra. This is what this is not about. This is about the country. And a lot of times we've prioritized the needs or the voices of Accra dwellers over so many parts of this country. We can't only understand what these other people are saying. And a lot of them who are offline, we can only understand if we get into those communities and try to mobilize them and have the same conversation and opportunities for engagement that we have provided Accra. Mm. Mami, um, looking into the future, I mean, some young people may be part of this mm -hmm. movement currently, but there will be overtures to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard a few people say, what do they want? Mm. And I, I find that quite odd because I think it's been clear. Mm. They want good jobs. They okay. want a sustainable way of life. They will. So knowing the economic hardship, mm -hmm. it's very easy to make overtures and break the ranks mm -hmm. of the movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I, I wanted to, because, you know, having um, Rocky, is one of the key things is that fix the country is, I don't think it's, a one, it's, um, it's about one person or a specific group of people. We all want the same things. And I think because Ghana, we are very accustomed to, oh, okay, so like because of politics, right? People cannot think outside that. So it's either like you are NDC or MPP or you are. And so one of the key things is that this, I think this whole thing is like, one is a movement. A movement is like, is, um, is beyond the people who are even in it, right? It's the idea that we all want the same things. And that's why even you can be asking what do they even want? They want what you want. So you can be MVP and you want fixed Ghana to be fixed. You can be NDC, you want Ghana to be fixed. One of the key things that people need to understand, and this is actually true, is that when it comes to religion and politics, people attach identity to ideas. So now the problem now is that people cannot divorce who they are from their part that they support. So once you even say, oh, fix the country now, then it, it, it sounds like MPP is bad, right? But that's not the thing. And if you don't take it and we don't break it down properly, you will miss the point. The idea of politics will always change, or your party ideally will always change. But what will always remain the same is what we want for Ghana. We all want light. We all want access to good health care. So the question is that right now, Ghana's problem, the only reason why it's frustrating, people cannot understand what the people want is because they're looking at it as we are in power now. What they're asking for is that now it's against what the party in power is doing. That is wrong. What they are doing is that they are asking for something that everybody should be asking for no matter what. 2050, you should still be asking. It's like, it's like <laughs> these things they are asking for yes. should be a given. Absolutely. Should and we should given. all want that. that. And that is why the fundamentals, like, because believe me, if you divorce certain political things from opportunities and people, you see people's allegiance. Mm -hmm. People are holding on to political ideology, number one, sometimes because of even like where they are from, their hometown, mm -hmm. or because of a the job. Family, Divorce, all of that, and you see where their allegiance is. That is why when you make the national pledge, you say, I promise on my own to be what? Faithful and loyal to Ghana. That means that even if my part, the party I don't like is in power, party you don't like is in power, I will still give my best because it's for Ghana. Right? Because I'll give an account. Whatever I'm sowing to this nation will speak years when I'm even dead and gone. And this is why the fix a country, even though there are people at the forefront as leaders and stuff, this is bigger than him. Because how many, he not, even if he lives up to 100, he will still live one day. This should be some that even 50 years down the line, we are always asking, Ghana should be fixed. Mm -hmm. So that even if you are an MPP and you wake up every day, that's why I have a problem now. Like I'm saying, we need to begin to find common ground and dialogue. Because when it comes to, nobody likes opposing views. It's very difficult because you feel like you're attacking your person. That's why sometimes when somebody even speaks about a problem, then you see people insult, stupid, and I'm like, ah, no, they're missing the point. So we should be able should to be now find. My Facebook pages. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, we should we should find common ground. Yeah, we should actually we should be able to sit with uh, MPP and DC, CEP and say, don't we all want the same thing? If Ghana is working, won't it benefit all oh, of us? Yes. This is not about our kufado. How long would all of these leaders live anyway? Most of them are even old we will still be stuck with the same Ghana after. So let us begin to find common ground and ask, they want what you want. Mm -hmm. Now how can we all get the same, same thing? things? Yeah. Let's work together for that. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Dr. Tete, in terms of meeting the needs of young people, um, I mean, it's not often you get the finance minister speaking and one 
nice Sunday, he, he gathered all of us and told us all the things uh, being done. He tried to explain to us the challenges uh, the country has faced in the last two years, particularly brought on by COVID. And then, of course, how we manage to service our debt. He gave the media review and indicated that they'll be seeking to provide some one million jobs over the next two years. Uh, they're ensuring that there's some strong fiscal discipline to ensure that, uh, you know, we don't get out of gear because knowing fully well that in 2024 we have to uh, prosecute an election, that is even the year we spend so much. Um, should young people be hopeful? Unfortunately, we don't have a plan, per se, of what, where the jobs are coming from, what sectors, what the target is, and the like. All we were told is part of it is focused on entrepreneurship. But then, um, any hopes? I, I believe young people should be hopeful but not because of what the finance minister said. <laughs> <laughs> because of what I saw on the demonstration day. You know, it's a beautiful thing to see people who have their sense of agency activated. So this was a, a march that was happening in a COVID era. Mm -hmm. And it was beautiful to see people going out, handing out face masks. People would go and tell fellow demonstrators that you need to wear the mask. That, that was wonderful. And then also, I think Oliver has spoken about those who were just cleaning the place. They knew what the right thing was. They knew it may represent some inconvenience to themselves. Someone told me that I need to clean it so that they understand the message that we are trying to, to preach. Um, so this is really where the hope is, that individuals know that they have the ability to be able to take control of their own circumstances and then act on it. I think that we should not stop on the track of holding the leadership accountable, whatever the, the, the point is. Because if we do not hold them, thankfully the president says that we should be citizens and not spectators. So that really should be the mantra where we hold them accountable. A lot of the time, I think our politicians have gotten into the space where they can make all the declarations they've made to you, but there's no follow-up. There's no accountability. Even if they don't do it, what happens? You know, so we need to not get tired. We need to stay engaged, and we need to hold them to the promises at all times. If you ask me whether when I went for the demonstration, I was demonstrating against the MPP, I would say no. I, was, I did not go to demonstrate against the MPP. We have a system that is not delivering the outcomes it promised. And so we all need to take a hard and honest look at it. In fact, the demonstrators slammed all of the political leaders since 1992. The only person who got any praise was President Nkrumah. So it just tells you clearly the focus. And I think that we should divorce it from some of these our partisan sentiments and put the nation first to be able to get the results that we are looking for. All right. And it's still the key points here on TV3 and 3FM. And you can continue to join the conversation. Our hashtag is hashtag the key points. You can also send your WhatsApp messages to 055-369-878. Eight, nine. And you can also follow us on our Facebook page. Just look for uh, TV3 Ghana and 3FM 92.7 on Facebook. And you can continue to follow us there as well. We are also live online at 3news.com. Send your thoughts through. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back taking uh, final comments from our panel. You're welcome back. It's hashtag the key points. My name is Jifa Bampo. This program is live on TV3. It's also live on 3FM 92.7. You can check out our Facebook page and follow us there. Just search for uh, TV3 underscore Ghana. Also search for 3FM 92.7. And also join us online at 3news.com. And I've had in the studio with me so far, uh, Oliver Bakavoma. He's the convener for the Fix the Country movement. And then we have uh, Mami Awenado. She's a consultant with Black Bridge Consulting, focusing a lot on trade, local and international. And Dr. Soji Soji Tete, he is the council chair for the Center for Social Justice. He's also a former vice president of the Ghana Medical Association. So, uh, Mr. Vomawo, in terms of sustainability for the movement, one of the key concerns I know that exists among people who follow 
the narrative is that, oh, very soon uh, people will be parachuted out, they'll be given juicy incentives, and the movement will be left destitute. Is that a fear? I know Mami has said this is bigger than just uh, partisan ideology or partisan interest, but when people's stomachs are mm -hmm. empty, anything can, can get them out. I think those concerns uh, affect people's, you know, caginess and cynicism around this must be respected because it is there, it repeats itself so much in our, in our politics that a lot of times people disengage from genuine projects or projects that could lead to something bigger than that. And the reason why a lot of political parties see that it work, do this because they've seen it work so many times. And it's, it comes from the fact that our politics lacks ideas and definitely does not want to reform itself. That it must do everything to co-opt voices and bring them into the status quo to maintain the status quo. And we have made a commitment. A lot of the persons who are involved in this have made a commitment to do different. In fact, on the day of the protest, uh, a lot of us involved there publicly took a pledge that we were not going to engage or take any money or do anything with any of the uh, main any of the political parties. But I want to make this point clearly. A lot of the things we're saying is that first the country is not going to become a political party of its own. That's not what we're thinking about. I am not looking to project myself into political leadership. I am an academic at heart. I love my job teaching and that's what I want to do. But I think the most important thing I want to address is that because we are waking so many young people up and so many people have become interested in the process, if, some, if everybody else tells me that, well, we only have two parties anyway, NDC and MPP, then it means that we are calling for reforms of those parties themselves. And so if young people who are coming up decide that we want to get into those spaces and reform the culture within those spaces, I encourage them to do so. They are entitled to participate in a democratic process and to improve the substance of it. But I think now the core messaging is that the parties have been around for a long time. We've had this shuffle for 30 years. We can sustain this a bit more than one demonstration in just three months. And we feel that things have changed dynamically. No. The, the broken system is a billion dollar industry. There's so many invested interests in keeping it broken. And if we do not have that mindset, we cannot reform that system. So that's a commitment we must make and watch for. Now about sustainability and how we move this forward. You know, going this forward, and so he was reminded me, reminded me of when I had put up a post saying that even if we have 15 people who show up, we're still going to do that because that's what is most important. And we went in there and so many times when you're doing this, it feels like you're speaking into the wind and that there's nobody who is listening. Fourth August brought that myth. And I'm hoping that as we continue to have this energy to do that, as we bring different people into the process, I've had conversations with so many young, even in places we haven't gone to, in the north, Activista, and so many different community networks that we are activating. We are hoping that they come onto the process and take this and own it. And it's only through having local community networks and young people and old people associations take this project on, can it depersonalize it, as we've been talking about, and send that message going forward. That's, that is the best way we can anticipate creating a framework for sustainability. Thank you. And let me just take some messages before I come back to Dr. Tete and to Mami Awenado. This one says, it's true, the 1992 constitution should be the first casualty of the fix the country agitation if we really want the country to be developed. But the constitution does not fix potholes. Neither does the constitution address health and working condition issues. The country can't be fixed when money meant for development projects always ends up in the hands of uh, corrupt politicians and their cronies. That's from Abladi. Takradi. This one says, I disagree with the health minister. He should be sanctioned accordingly. But why? Where were the hashtag fix the country demonstration when John Dramani Mahama was in office? So this tells us that they are all NDC, including the pastor who spoke. So they should wait and see. This one from Abu. This one says, good morning to you and your panel. There's a lot to be fixed in this country. There had been a change of curriculum in the basic schools for over two years now, and there is no single textbook provided. Yet government was able to procure past questions for SHS students, yet they tell teachers not to speak to any media. All is not well in this country. Hashtag fix the country. This Fred from Winchi in the Bono Half region. Philip from Accra says, we the youth of Ghana need a change in our constitution. Our leaders are not helping 
us. And uh, finally, it says, uh, Chris, this is from Christian in Takradi. You guys are really on point enjoying your show. Thank you very much for all your text messages. And feel free to send more on 055 uh, 369 So I guess this comes to the final bit of, of the questions as we get ready to wrap up. One of the demands is a new constitution. And so there was a specificity to that. Expunge the Article 71, which... I mean, the last time I did a count, it's not just politicians, you know. I mean, these are some senior public servants and, and all that. And they come up to what? Some 600 people, you know, sitting under Article 71. I'm just wondering, Soji, we've had a constitution that has run for 30 years. It serves us well in some purposes. It's given us a certain stability that we lacked for close to, what, 20 years uh, or 30 years from the 1960s. Is it realistic to ask for a new constitution? And really, will politicians deliver it, knowing that they are, and some senior public servants, they are the key beneficiaries of this current constitution? Yeah, I think it's, it's a realistic call. And in many of the democracies, they would tell you that the constitutions are living documents. So we are not supposed, we, we, it's supposed to serve a purpose. And when that purpose is not being met, it's okay to reflect and to ask ourselves which aspects that we can, you can, we can reform. And you recall that President Mills put together a constitutional review committee that came up with an elaborate report. Government issued a white paper, and that was, that was it. A lot of the things were, were not accepted. Yeah. yeah. So, and in, uh, the American constitution has been reviewed. The British have had an opportunity to reflect on certain specific provisions. So these are dynamic you know, documents, and there's, there's nothing wrong with, with looking at it. You talk about Article 71. I mean, these are all people working in the public service. And yet, whenever we've come up with either a health sector salary structure or a single spine salary structure, we see that it doesn't apply equally across. From a social justice perspective, we are asking, why shouldn't we have the same spine for everybody? You know, the justification, this is why people talk about the fact that people are going into politics motivated not by the transformation they can bring, but because it's become a pathway to personal wealth. I think that we can look at that. There are issues around seeing parliament as a stepping stone to the executive, and thereby weakening parliament's ability to hold the executive accountable. So perhaps we could be looking at a complete separation of powers so that the accountability mechanisms will be strengthened. Or reduce the percentage. Or reduce the, the percentage. Because the percentage talks up. I think a lot of the time we say the percentage says the majority of ministers come from parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, Oliver, you were on the Constitution Review uh, mm -hmm. Commission. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's not less than 50% of ministers. Mm -hmm. So it means that you can actually keep the number of appointees from mm. parliament much lower mm. than what it looks like a majority of maybe 70 mm. or 80 mm. percent. Yeah, you're absolutely spot on. I think even the problem goes a little beyond ministers because now there's really no separation between parliament and executive. Mm. <laughs> Why? Because you have members of parliament now who have been appointed to boards who are now MDs. Mm. It mm. doesn't sit with the constitutional ethic because they have now become part of part and parcel of the executive. Yeah. And that's not what the constitution ever intended. It was supposed to cure just one mischief. And now we've used it as a license to blow apart parliament. Now the leader, the leader of the majority in parliament is also the minister for, for parliamentary affairs. So there's sort of... He, the, the criss -cross, becomes one and the one. The criss-cross is a bit too much now. There's, there's really no... And so I always say that this constitution put up a framework within which parliament was set up to fail. And, and, and that intention was already evident even in, in when the documents were being framed. Because the, the poison pill of that majority ministers comes from the 1979 experience, mm -hmm. when for the first time ever in this republic, parliament says no to a government budget presented by Professor Bene. And we say that no, that means there's something wrong. So I think there's an ethical or, or the fact that, that, that the Volta region at that time had no member uh, of parliament, and so that person could not be, um, they could not appoint uh, a minister, minister from, the, from, from the region. So that was also uh, an issue. Mami, someone sent us a text message. The constitution doesn't give jobs, doesn't pay bills, it doesn't solve your health care problems. Is it a new constitution or it is the actors who must implement what is in the document properly? Well, obviously, like um, the the written word or the what is on paper has to be reformed, right? I was even looking at Article 70, right, and the powers of the president to appoint, you know, and all of those things where it's like 
the reformation is required because you see you don't want to put too much power on human beings because human beings are fickle all of us as human beings, we, even today, how you feel today will be different. Of how, like you will feel differently tomorrow, right? And so the whole idea of reforming the constitution is that it's a constitution that drives the kind of people who sit and determine certain things, right? At the same time, it doesn't necessarily change who the people are. That's why the value system is necessary, like important that we actually have a value system. But the constitution helps to be able to like create proper structure of how things are run in the state. And so reformation, yes, it won't build schools, but it can determine, it can help reduce the level of, you begin to even see those who really have um, genuine interest in really like helping to govern the state or people are going there because of business. Because see, we are, all, we are selfish as people. Trust me, everybody has, in fact, you won't even know how selfish you are until you are placed in a position where the, the, you are given the chance to be selfish. That is why I can, I'm very careful about even wanting to say, hey, I want, you know when you say, oh, when I'm in power, I will never do this. And you know what happens sometimes? You'll be at home and you see something that is not for you and then maybe you don't want to ask and maybe you take more than you're supposed to take. You're like, oh, maybe I'll never do that if I had. See, the small things that we do will always play out in the big space. So what we are seeing happening on the big space, eh? it's a human trait. So the system must be able to regulate human weaknesses because everybody is fallible. So he who, that, who is without sin, nobody is perfect. That is why you need a constitution that helps to manage the weakness of man because man is weak. And if you read things like about gold, the human beings are, can be very depraved. Trust me, especially when it comes to survival. When people see and they're hungry, forget it. So that is why we need to have a constitution and a system that helps to regulate even our weaknesses. Lest you even think that you are not making a mistake, but you are. And that is why constitutional reform is so important. We shouldn't see it as, you shouldn't desire too much power. Because that power will destroy you. It's nice in the beginning when you are controlling it, but you don't even know when you are slipping. And what is, what, what is life that you die and don't leave a proper legacy? And that is why I'm saying that in Ghana we have, we even, you know what, what we call murder. I know Ghana we like to say, oh, which is not demon break. break. But trust me, there's nothing more powerful than the kind of evil you see is when they ask you to do the road and you didn't do it well. And hundreds of people come and die. You're not a murderer because you didn't pull a gun. But your action caused the death of people. That is where we must come to with our conscience. We call the conscious leaders that we realize that your one decision back will affect me. Everybody, our everyday decision, you, as a mother, if you wake up and you make one wrong decision, your child can come and pay some price they didn't even have to pay for but because you made a little decision. So that is why we need a constitution that helps to manage the weaknesses of human beings because we're all fallible. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we can have proper, that's why we do need constitutional reform. It's that's in our best interest. Well, let's so. see if, let's see if uh, the powers that be will, will pick up <laughs> on that. And uh, we've been uh, discussing the fix the country demonstration. What next? What are those quick issues, low hanging fruits that government uh, can address quickly and what is the sustain sustainability path for the fix the country movement my guests have been uh oliver baka vomawa convener for the fix the country movement he's a private legal practitioner as well as a legal academic mami awinado consultant with black bridge consulting focusing a lot on local and international trade and then dr soji soji tete council chair for the Center for Social Justice. Let me just take uh, some quick messages that have come from all of you. This one uh, reads, um, they allow them to do a demonstration. They allow them to do a demonstration about fix the country. How can we use the money to buy V8 for MPs whilst we have schools under trees? Uh, that's from Maxwell, Dunkwa Onofin. It wasn't very clear though, but it, this one from Kunto in Kumasi reads, the so-called jobs they are promising will be given to party loyalists so that they can win the next election. The problem of the Ghanaian youth is political discrimination. I think he's referring to the one million mm. uh, jobs that the finance minister says they're hoping to create over the next two years. This one from Lambert at Okuse says, congratulations to Mr. Vormawa for leading the Fix the Country. It's now time to turn attention to Akuse, our motherland, to fix Akuse, the road leading to the Akuse Hospital, which is one of the oldest hospitals in Ghana, which serves five municipalities, is a recipe for disaster. And Musa Abatwa and Kumasi writes, Jifa, anyone who underrates the effect of fix the, country, fix the Ghana demonstration doesn't understand the current political dynamics. 
Fix Ghana is not a political group, but a movement that wants better for the country. I totally support the activities and wish they could do the demonstration across all the 16 regions of Ghana. So that's been uh, the first part of our discussion on the key points. My name is Jifa Bampo. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back with our next topic because it's been 29 years of the NPP. I know it's not the usual 25, 30 years where you want to talk about a milestone, but 29 years for a political party that started really or rose from the embers of the ashes together with other parties like the DPP, the Egle Party. The question you ask is, where are they all now? We now have two dominant parties, the NPP and the NDC. We'll be having that discussion when we come back. Stay with us.